Warning, you are now listening to Up in Flames. We up in flames, yeah. We up in flames, yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Let me hear it, Lambo. We up in flames, we up in flames, we up in flames, yeah, we up in flames, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 we up in flames, yeah. Yeah, uh, we up in flames, hold on, uh, check this go We up in flames, yeah, uh, we up in, uh, yeah, yeah, we up in flames, yeah Woo! We up in, uh, yeah, we up in flames, we up in flames What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another edition of Up in Flames here on Dash Radio on the Nothing But Net channel. As always, I am your host, Mo Murphy, and today I got a special guest. He's been on the show before, but we had to get him on now that y'all are able to hear me here on Dash Radio. I got my guy Jordan Foot in the building, and if y'all don't know who he is, he's Foot Noted on Twitter. He drops gems, but he's also the host of the Roughing the Kicker pod. He was covering... uh the Utah Jazz for 48 minutes. You know, he's grinding. He works with, you know, with Rashad Phillips over there at Sports Talk 2319. So he has so many jobs and and so much content that he puts out. But let me enough boosting him up. I'm going to give him the floor. Jordan, how's it going, bro? Man, good, Mo. It's always good to be back. uh, I'm super stoked that you've been on Dash Radio putting in work. I've been peeping some of the content. So, man, that's all good stuff. And I'm, I'm super excited to be here. Yeah, 100%, bro. I mean, you know, since we last talked, like, actually on the podcast, bro, both of us have really made some, some major strides because I think prior to that, you you weren't the uh, the main host. You weren't the host of the Rough and the Kicker pod. You took that from Tucker, if I'm not mistaken, right, as he moved on? Yeah, yeah. Tucker, like, big-timed everybody and jumped up. So I got um, – I took his role, and then I'm taking over the Royal site for Sports Illustrated, too. So um, stuff like that works out. I mean, for anyone listening, it really sometimes isn't – what you know it really is who you know and forming those connections helps quite a bit yeah i mean definitely like yeah so like you said you know i wasn't on dash radio you know you weren't the host of the rough and the kicker pod and and everything else that you've put out you know you've been covering the nba draft uh you know writing the articles bro it covering football all together <laughs> every article you cover with with kansas city you know not only do i share it i read it uh i, I check out everything i can too so you know you definitely do great work uh, before we get started, you know, obviously we're going to talk a lot of NBA, but before we get started for all the listeners, go to my bookie using promo code off the ball. They match 50% of your first deposit up to a thousand dollars. So make sure you go check our good people at and my bookie again, that's my bookie.ag is the website and use promo code off the ball. They match 50% of your first deposit up to a thousand dollars. So make sure you go do that. But without further ado, Y'all get to know who y'all know who my guy Jordan Foot is. So let's just get straight into the NBA. And, and, you know, I've seen it. It's been on ESPN. It's been on Fox Sports. It's been everywhere. And I don't think everybody has been covering this move the right way. Uh, And of course, because it affects LeBron James and the villain in the NBA and Russell Westbrook. But for those of y'all that don't know or already know, Russ is now in a Lakers uniform and has officially been introduced as a Laker. So the main concern for everybody has been, does Russ in L.A. fit? And if you think he fits, how does he fit? But, you know, they have to entertain. They have to say some some outlandish stuff that really doesn't make sense. So me and Jordan here are going to cover it in the right thought process and really break down to you. So I'm going to give it to you, Jordan. For First off, do you think Russ in L.A. is a fit? Man, not like a natural fit. Like I think it, they're going to have to get – creative a little bit like really LeBron's gonna have to play more off the ball I think um he's gonna have to take some more catch and shoot threes which I think with him aging that's gonna be where his game goes anyway a little bit more perimeter oriented um he's kind of losing that speed a little bit so Russ man people like to dog on Russ and point out all the stuff he can't do but they don't want to appreciate the stuff he can do like that guy great rebounder he's gonna help there um, getting Dwight Howard back is going to help rebounding. Like I'm not worried about them losing any of that, even if AD is playing at the five. But Russ, dribble penetration, fantastic. Um, he's going to open up lob opportunities for AD. 
He's going to get shots for floor spacers. It's going to be like another LeBron driving to the rim. And like, if you're a defense, you have to pick one or the other. Like, what if it's a fast break and Russ and LeBron are running it? Like, you're doomed no matter what. I mean, he's a great finisher. He's a slasher. So I think on the ball, he's going to have to just keep attacking the rim and take less um, pull-up, mid-range jumpers, less threes, stuff like that. And that's the only thing I'm worried about is he's in like his 12th, 13th season, 14th, however long he's been in the league. He kind of is who he is at this point. So um, LeBron, we've seen him make some like weird facial expressions and gestures on the court. <laughs> he can't really do that with Russ because like him and Russ are cool. So he's going to be a little frustrated at first. There's going to be, you know, a learning curve, but I think on and off the ball, if they get creative enough, I think it'll work out. Yeah. So I don't, I'm, I'm with you. It's not a natural fit, but I don't think it's, I don't, how am I supposed to say it? So I, I think it's not a natural fit, but I think they are going to fit. I think they're going to be fine. I mean, you look at people didn't think Kyrie and LeBron would fit. I understand Russ isn't Kyrie Irving, but just to put in perspective of like, LeBron made it work. Guys will make things work and sacrifice for championships. Look at Kyrie and James Harden. That was mm-hmm. everybody's like, there's no way. They're two ball dominant. You know, both of them are ISO guards. James Harden is more of a point guard, but Kyrie always need, he can't play off the ball. You know, that was kind of everything that was said about them two. And it was like, KD's going to fit because he fits wherever he goes. You can put him anywhere with anybody and he's going to be a natural fit. He'll be fine because of his play style. And you look, and Harden and Kyrie basically sat down and, and figured out a way to make the sacrifice to make it work. And granted, we didn't get to see them on the court together much. Uh, when they were, it, it looked fine. Nobody looked out of place. Harden didn't look like he did. He wasn't going to be able to figure it out, and neither did Kyrie. So I think Russ will be able to do the same thing. I mean, ultimately, this Lakers team is really a one-last-ride team. Like, they all got put together. Like, this is Carmelo Anthony, Dwight Howard. You know, Dwight already got a championship, but he's looking for, you know, one last ride. Let's get another one for L.A. Um, You know, LeBron's looking for probably at least one more, you know, before the end of his career. Anthony Davis is, like, in the prime of his career. So to win multiple championships would do a lot for, for, you know, his case of building a legacy. And Russell Westbrook, a championship would solidify pretty – and would make everybody appreciate everything Russell Westbrook has done up to this point because it's kind of underappreciated because he doesn't have that championship. You know, Chris Paul, the same way. You know, I think even James Harden, like some of these guys who don't have a championship, what they've done gets undervalued because everything has to be solidified with a ring in today's generation. So I don't really like that for Russ. I think he'll make it fit. He'll figure it out. He'll make it work. And you look at it, they surrounded Russ and LeBron with shooters. That's that's the best way to build a team around those two guys. Surround them with shooters. Get guys when they drive, they can dish. Russ is a walking triple double. It's not like he's not a willing passer. He is a willing passer. The first year he averaged a triple double, everybody was like, well, it's because he has to pass because they're double and triple teaming him. All right, well, you've given him Paul George. He's averaged a triple double. You've given him James Harden. He was like a, a assist away from a triple double or like a rebound and assist away from a triple double. So it doesn't matter who he's play, who he plays with. He's going to give that production on the court. So I do think that it's not, like you said, it's not going to be a natural fit. It's going to be a little funky in the beginning. They got to figure out. But friendship and loyalty is huge in LeBron's eyes. You know, I kind of think LeBron is like Dominic Toretto when it comes to that. Like family is everything. Loyalty, my friendship. I will make it work with guys I love and care about. And I think that's going to be the best benefit for the Lakers uh, with LeBron and Westbrook is the fact that they got love for each other. Yeah, absolutely, man. And you look at LeBron like, I love LeBron. I I don't think he's the best player in the league anymore. He's still top five, I think. Um, He's still absolutely fantastic. He could come back at the beginning of this season healthy and make everyone look like fools. Like, I think I'll give him a month heading into the season. I'll I'll just suspend judgment and say, you know what, maybe he hasn't lost his step. Because I remember the year before this year, last year, people were saying the same thing. Like, oh, LeBron's lost his step. Oh, he's washed, blah, blah, blah. I don't think he's washed, but I think he literally has lost maybe one step. And still, that one step makes him better than 99% of the NBA. So he's still an elite-level player. Um, Whether he's the best or not, who knows. But, man, he's getting old. Like, they're going to have to manage his minutes. They're going to have to manage his games played. They're going to have to 
um, take care of him. What better person to do that than like the Iron Man of the league? Like put the team on my back. He's going to like, if they have back to backs, they can rest AD play Russ. They can win. If they have a back to back to back, they can rest LeBron. They can play Russ. They're going to win. Like it gives you a higher ceiling, I think, and a higher floor in the regular season playoff time. It's going to be interesting, but man, you brought up the uh, acquisitions they made like Malik Monk, Wayne Ellington, Carmelo, Kent Bazemore, Trevor Ariza, um, Kendrick Nunn, Dwight Howard coming back. All those guys, except for Dwight, can space the floor. Like, they can shoot. Melo will give you something on ball. Um, Bazemore will try to give you something on ball. Malik Monk is a young player um, with potential still. Kendrick Nunn can give you a little bit off the bench. Dwight is going to probably start quite a few games for them. Um, Melo could, Ariza could, Monk could. Like, all these guys... What they did in one off season, really in one week, like a three day span, is insane. Like they they rebuilt the entire roster basically. Um, they made some moves I didn't expect them to make. Like at first, I was like, you know, I'd take Buddy Heel over Westbrook for that team. But then you think it, it gives them a higher ceiling. Like if it does work with Russell Westbrook, they're going to be right there with the Nets in the finals. Like if it works with Buddy Heald you know they're going to be a tough outcome playoff time, but if Russ, LeBron, and AD can coexist, and like you said with sacrifices, if they make them, they're going to be a scary team. Yeah, and so before we move on, because you did hit on that, and, and you know, that they're kind of the story of the offseason is what the Lakers did. And, you know, adding Buddy Hill, it, it would have made more sense as far as we know as a natural fit. Hill's game will fit with LeBron, like you said, but the the – the what if, and when they traded for Westbrook, everybody's like, oh my God, well, how are they going to get, you know, all these guys? And then boom, they get every aged veteran and the storyline is they're old, right? But yep. every player has, every player that they got looked like they still can contribute to a championship team last season. And everybody's like, well, they're giving up their future. They're really not. First off, you have Anthony Davis in his prime. If LeBron retires after this season, they win a championship. They ride off into the sunset. AD has a, a a quality, healthy year. It'll be nothing for a prime AD to convince some star to come join him in a Lakers uniform. So the fact that they have a prime AD, and then they got Malik Monk, who I think of all the players on this roster, he's going to benefit the most. He started coming to his own last season. Uh, you know, I guess the, the bust word gets thrown around a little too harshly Um, for me. Yep. He's what, 22? He's, he's, he's young. Yeah, he's young. He's like 22, 23 max. Um, and, and look at what he was doing. Like Malik Monk was certified. I felt like coming out of that draft, he was probably the best player in the draft. And I felt like he would have, and I was wrong, you know, obviously. But because he was a walking bucket, I'm like, he's going to be able to survive in this league. If you could get your own bucket, you're going to survive in the league and you're going to find the right spot. Charlotte was coming into their own. Malik Monk was able to, you know, come into his own also. So I think he's going to benefit learning behind LeBron, learning behind Westbrook, other aspects of his game that he doesn't have. He's going to be able to get the ultimate lesson from the ultimate players about an all-around game to add to the fact that he has a bag that he can dive deep in to get his own bucket. So I think Malik Monk fits perfectly. And when we're talking about this team built for this year, they're – what they have to be a top three team favored it to, to win the championship. So, you know, I, I kind of, I, I, I would like everybody to hold off on like trying to kill the Lakers about their age. This is a one year experiment. This isn't, this is trying to get a lot of these guys, their first championship, maybe Russ LeBron and AD is like the next two to three years, but the rest of these additions were one year signings. It's a one year experiment. Melo is not going to retire in a Lakers uniform. He's, you know, he's probably going to sign with Denver, New York, and end up maybe taking his last rodeo there next season. But everybody does have to understand. And if some of these guys hit, you may end up keeping a Kendrick Nunn for the for the long haul. You might keep Malik Monk for the long haul. So that's something everybody else has to think about when it comes to the Lakers. Yeah, absolutely. People, they overreact because it's LeBron. They overreact because it's the Lakers. They overreact because it's Westbrook. Like so many polarizing personalities and players on the same team. Like, they're going to be fine. They're going to score a lot. The defense is probably a little bit worse than it was last season. But Frank Vogel, one of the best defensive-minded coaches in the league, like, he's going to get the most out of that. Um, they have enough rim protection. They have enough perimeter protection, I think, to be okay. 
Um, AD is switchable. LeBron, if he doesn't play as many minutes or as many games, he can lock in and play good defense still. He's been great in spurts um, over the past few years. So I think they're going to be okay. Um, It's going to be a learning process, I think, for all of them, including LeBron, including AD, including Russ. But when you have a bunch of role players who know what they're going to do, and like it's not like the Lakers have had a problem getting guys that will like take a back seat. Like they've had a bunch of guys who will take a back seat. They haven't had guys who will take shots and make shots and be aggressive. Mello will get him some shots off the bench. Malik Monk is going to take him some shots. Um, Wayne Ellington is going to shoot some threes if he's open. Bazemore is the same thing. Kendrick Nunn's going to get to the bucket and score. Um, they have aggressive minded players. And if LeBron needs them to take a step back, they can. And like the greatest thing about this, I think Vogel can stagger minutes to where one of those three LeBron, AD Russ, maybe even two of them on the court at the same time. Like they're hardly ever going to have all three of them on the bench and then have an entire like backup unit out there. So Vogel can get creative. Um, I think just managing health. If this team's healthy, they're going to be, like you said, a top three favorite to win the championship. Yeah, I a hundred percent agree. Like that's just, that is just everything I feel with the Lakers. But, you know, you, you were at one point covering the Utah Jazz. So, you know, we got to we gotta kind of get in there. I like what they've done. Uh, they're coming off a season where what they had the best record in the NBA, number one in the Western Conference, obviously fell short, wasn't able to get to the Conference Finals or the NBA Finals. Uh, Donovan Mitchell got a little bit banged up. Mike Conley was banged up uh, throughout the season and especially um, in the playoffs. So, they, they had a nice offseason. In, in my opinion, the additions of Rudy Gay and Hassan Whiteside was, I, I think, matches made in heaven and obviously keeping Mike Conley. I think that was the Utah Jazz's number one, you know, priority going into free agency was we have to retain Mike Conley. Yeah, he's been injured and, you know, the injury bug has hit him, but his impact on Utah since he's been there when he is on the court it's just that's been the story of his career is like on his impact on the court for any team, even when he was in Memphis, has been like he's worth he, he wasn't asking for 30 million dollars a year. You were gonna have to overpay. You just want to make sure you retained them. And then to add depth to your bench by bringing in Rudy Gay and Hassan Whiteside. And I don't think Hassan can move the he can't run the floor as effective as Rudy Gobert, but outside of that, essentially he does everything else well. That Rudy Gobert does. Uh, he could be a head case sometimes and want a little more than maybe he deserves, you know, wants a few more touches than maybe he deserves. And I understand that. You know, he came out, for, came from the bottom, grinded it out, and had a coming out hot season with Miami. He, he started feeling himself a little bit, got a, got a nice little payday, started feeling himself a little bit. But I think he's been a little humbled since then. And obviously, Rudy Gay, he's that aging veteran that he still can give you some quality minutes, but you can't look at him to give you. You know, 35 minutes a game, but he could give you 20 to 25 off the bench, maybe give you 12 to 15 a night. But that's the type of guy that you need come the playoff time. So based on their their acquisitions, what do you and how they're going to look going into next season? What what grade do you give their offseason or, or how did you evaluate their offseason? Yeah, man, I think considering like the money they did or didn't have the draft capital, they didn't have. You got to give them like a B or a B plus. Like, I think. Could they have somehow swung a trade for like a prototypical two way wing player or guard? Yeah, but like how many two way prototypical guards are available out there? Like, it not, there's only so many Paul Georges out there that can do that. Um, Victor Oladipo is not in his prime anymore, um, or at least until he comes back and proves it. So, guys that can do something on both ends at either the two or the three spot, they're hard to come by. So, you get Jared Butler in the draft. Um, that was a steal. I think speaking of health, he's a guy that without the health concerns, first round pick, good on ball ability, shot creation, defensive effort. He'll help off the bench. You think of a bench unit like Butler, Clarkson, Whiteside, Rudy Gay, like Joe Ingles, unless Ingles is in the starting five. Like that's pretty good. Rudy Gay can play some small ball five. He's been doing that a lot with the Spurs. Um, so Whiteside, fantastic rebounder which is something the Jazz haven't always had off the bench. Um, really, the main thing, Derek Favors was exposed in the postseason, and I thought he was going to be good in Utah, but he just could not keep up um, with like guys like Valanciunas. He was just getting destroyed. So I think Whiteside can provide some rim protection. Um, obviously, 
missing Rudy Gobert, you're going to know that he's gone. But Whiteside is going to be a better backup center, I think, than Favors was. You mentioned Rudy Gay is going to help a lot. So all things considered, they traded for uh, Eric Pascal from Golden State for pretty much nothing. So that was a good acquisition. He's a guy that that could be the bench lineup, like Butler, Clarkson, uh, Pascal, and then Gay and Whiteside. Like that's that's a really good backup unit. So again, just like the Lakers, um, health, super important. Like Donovan Mitchell, he was so hurt. Like that ankle was so screwed up in the playoffs and he was still dropping like 35 a night. Mike Conley came back, was kind of like Harden, like the hamstring, he just couldn't move. So the Jazz are healthy. They probably get past the Clippers. They probably get to the Western Conference Finals. Who knows what happens after that? So you just have to run it back. And I think on a team that was thinking about trading Joe Ingles, was thinking about trading Bogdanovich, the best thing to do was probably run it back one or two more times and just kind of add some depth. And I think they did that pretty well. Yeah, I think I like what the Jazz got going. I felt like I, I hate to say the word fluke, but I felt like what they had did through, you know, in the regular season last year, like I was like, OK, they'll probably collapse uh, at some point, you know, in the playoffs. I just didn't think they were built like a championship team, at least not yet. I think Mitchell still needed a little bit more experience. I think after this, like I think after this past season, I think coming into this season, though, like I think he's here. Like, I yeah. think you know, uh, Rudy Gobert had even got exposed a little bit. But that's the that's the thing about Rudy Gobert is is a great center when you really think about what a center is supposed to be able to do. But because we have Jokic and Embiid, you know, Bam out of bio, we have these centers who do stuff that we've never seen centers be able to do, handle the rock, shoot the three, get, get a little shifty when they need to, like, we're not used to that as far as centers actually being able to do that. And a lot of people like the underrated guy from back in the day was Hakeem Olajuwon as far as getting shifty, but still all of that was like out of the post and face you up in the post and do it. These guys are doing it from outside in, from three-point line in. So then you look at Rudy Gobert and you're like, well, he's not the ultimate center that we want because he's no more than 12 to 15 points a night, but he gets you about 12, 13 rebounds. You know, um, he, he gets you one to three blocks. He can vary in between that a night. So I think Rudy Gobert is very undervalued or, or underappreciated for what he does. And I think he is the perfect center for Utah. But I also think that there could be a way if it doesn't work and they don't have the success that they feel like that team should have. I could see them moving on from Rudy Gobert and seeing what kind of value they could get for him. Obviously, we know the COVID fallout they had. They clearly were past that. But even still, like, I still could see, like, there's a world where Rudy Gobert does not play for the Utah Jazz anymore at the trade deadline. They're not feeling the success, you know, that, that they thought they would have. And you're not giving up on Donovan Mitchell. Like, Donovan Mitchell is your maximum contract guy. You keep him in Utah. He's your sales pitch to convince anybody to come to Utah because outside of that, like, nobody has a free agent. Big time free agent is just like, yeah, I'm I'm gonna make things shake and I'm gonna go to Utah and see if I can build a championship team. But maybe another star free agent is willing to do so alongside Donovan Mitchell. So I do want to ask you one thing before we get into to me is one of the really better topics of the offseason. I want to ask you one thing. So we have the NBA Hall of Fame or we have the basketball hall of fame. So I've had arguments about certain guys who deserve to be in there and who don't. So we're bringing up Rudy Gobert. Is in your eyes, is Rudy Gobert gonna be in the Hall of Fame when his career is all said and done? Not first ballot, just is he a Hall of Famer when it's all said and done? Would I vote him or is he gonna actually end up there? Would you vote him? I wouldn't vote him, but I think there is with like his accolades, I think he has what two defensive player of the years now. Um, I think three. three. Yeah, if he ends up with more than he has now, like how do you not? Like, I don't really, I'm bad about knowing the history of the Hall of Fame and, like, guys that are aren't in. But, like, only so many guys can win that many. Only so many guys can win, like, a couple in a row. Um, he He's influential. If he has one or two more throughout the rest of his career, um, I think he is going to end up there. I just, I'm really stingy. Like, I think that there should only be a certain amount of players. Like, you have to really, really, really do something. Like, Draymond Green's going to make it into the Hall of Fame. Because it's the basketball Hall of Fame, he has the Olympic success. 
Um, he had Michigan State. He has the championships. He has the accolades. Like if Gobert won a championship, if Gobert won another Defensive Player of the Year or two, um, if he suddenly started dropping like eighteen a game or even like twenty a game for a few years, got his average up a little bit. Um, I think that I'm hesitant about voting him in, but I think he's going to probably end up there by the time it's all said and done. Okay, so I'm going to ask you one more question before I cut. And you'll see where I'm coming from with this because we've had this argument. And Gobert was actually the guy that made me stand on my argument. So Ben Wallace, would you have voted, would Ben Wallace have gotten your vote into the Hall of Fame? Probably. Yeah, probably. Like, like, it's close. Like, I think I would have voted Ben Wallace, but, like, it's not like I'm definitely against Rudy Gobert. Like, if he wins one more, it's it's undeniable. Like, I just, I don't know. That's a tough question, man, because I don't know Ben Wallace's numbers. Like, frankly, I don't care what the numbers are, really. Like, it's more of an accolades and a championship type thing, and if you were good, you were good. Um, but without knowing all of the stuff behind him, I think I would have voted for him. Um, and if Gobert can win something throughout the rest of his career, I think it's going to be hard for people to say no. Yeah, so my argument was the fact I didn't think I wouldn't have voted Ben Wallace personally into the Hall of Fame. I'm a guy, see, if I had created my own Hall of Fame, I think if you're borderline, to me, that means you don't get in. If you have like, to hesitate, then it's not worth it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same here. Like, we're not talking about, you know, uh, like they like to say the Hall of Very Good. We're talking about the Hall yep. of Fame. If and I also I'm a believer. I know baseball does it in a way, but I'm a believer. You got five years after eligibility. You can't make it in five years. You're gone. Your eligibility yep. for Hall of Fame should be gone. I understand. You know that the votes come down to some people who just may not know. But my thing is this: if you after five years of eligibility, there were five years of people that made you not qualify. You weren't good enough. That that's yep. just. My opinion, I'm a lot tougher. And I think with Ben Wallace, I think as great as he was defensively, my only pushback would be I don't think so. And his, his game was never about the numbers. But he did yeah. average six points a game and nine rebounds. Like, that was his average. Yes, he was a, a defensive GOAT in a sense. You know, he's one of the best defensive players we've actually seen of all time. But he had, I think, four defensive player of the years as opposed to Rudy Gobert's three. He had... Five all defensive first teams. I think Rudy Gobert is at four right now. So Rudy Gobert is essentially one defensive first team away, one defensive player of the year, and one championship away from literally having what you would see overall as a better career than Ben Wallace. Because if he gets all that and then you match up the numbers, you're like, okay, Rudy Gobert for his career averaged 13 points a game and 13 rebounds. Ben Wallace averaged six and nine. They got the same accolades. Rudy Gobert was the better player especially in a time where centers who couldn't shoot really wasn't that relevant. So that that's my only thing. And so I just wanted to touch on that a little bit because people get upset with me. And I'm like, it's not to disrespect Ben Wallace, but what yeah. I'm saying is like, I would hesitate. And if I have to hesitate, it's not about being a first ballot hall of famer, but if I have to figure out a world where there is you in there as a hall of fame player, I just, it's a no. Like if there's five years after eligibility, if you're not in, as fair or unfair as that may be to some people, you shouldn't get in. That means five yeah. classes have came. A couple is going to be first ballot. So you've had a few guys who have been first ballot throughout those five years and other guys who have been waiting for forever that if they've been waiting 10, 15 years to get in and they still made a better argument than you who's been waiting four years to get in, I just don't think you should be eligible at that point. Yeah, no, that's fair. And that's kind of where I'm at with Gobert. Like, I'm hesitant. So I'm like, if I have to think for longer than like 30 seconds about it, I don't think you should get in. Like, it's an exclusive club where guys that are accomplished and have the numbers, if I think of their name and the first thing I think of is yes, then they should be in. But if it's like, no, I don't know, maybe let's compare them to this guy. Let's see. Then it comes into play. You have five chances. And if you can't get in with those five chances and separate from the pack, you shouldn't be in. So I'm with you. It's it's too loose, I think, letting people in there. Um, it's good for the players, obviously, to get the, the recognition and all that stuff. But if we were in charge, there would definitely be like probably half as many players <laughs> as there are right now currently in there. Yeah, and, and so even with saying that, you know, before we move on, I've actually looked 
at the list of guys each year who has gotten in. And there really isn't that many I would remove. Sure. Um, but I will say there's a FIBA Hall of Fame. There's a FIBA Hall of Fame. There's a, I'm not big. I don't like, I think there should be an NBA Hall of Fame. I think there's, because there's a college basketball Hall of Fame. So I think all of that should be separate. I don't think it should be basketball. And the reason I say that, my argument was Vladi Diva. And we don't have to jump into him, but here's where I'm coming from. I looked at Vladi Diva, right? And I looked at basketball reference. All the hoopers know how in-depth basketball reference gets. All yep. the analytics, everything you could find on Vladi Divac's career was on basketball reference. And at the bottom, it gave a Hall of Fame probability. Now, granted, he's already in, but it gave a probability. It was less than 1%. Mm -hmm. Out of every analytic, every way they analyzed the game at basketball reference, it came to the conclusion that it was less than 1% that Vladi Divac had a Hall of Fame career. And he gets in, and, and the argument is like, well, well, look what he did overseas. Mm -hmm. But he played like 16 years. Uh, it was like 13, 14 years in the NBA. But because of what he did, that's to me, that's FIBA Hall of Fame worthy. Mm -hmm. Like what you did, we have to grab resumes. A bit, well, what you did in college and then the NBA and then overseas or Olympics, I think that should all be separate. Maybe Olympics and solely Olympics in, in your NBA career can play a factor. I think because really you're representing USA and it's every four years. So it's not like an international thing all the time. But outside of that, I don't think like like world championships type type scrimmages. I don't think any of that should matter. I think what you did in the NBA should get you in the NBA. I think NBA should have a Hall of Fame. What you did in college should possibly get you in the College Basketball Hall of Fame. Because if you think about it, College Basketball Hall of Fame is a very elite group in a sense. Yep. Like everybody gets there. And a lot of guys don't get there because they these one and done guys really don't get there. You see the Tyler Hands bros because – they play and have four great years. So I'm just a little skeptical. I know we got a little off talking about the Hall of Fame, but just speaking of the jazz, I just wanted to hit on that subject. So we got we got a little bit of more time. We got a little bit more time. So we're going to talk about these last two topics. But to me, this is the one so far that's kind of the most interesting because you can get a, you're getting a wave of opinions on this. And it's the fact that Dennis Schroeder bet on himself and he lost the bet. But people who were out there were gamblers. We're gamblers in life. We take gambles. We lose, we win. Everybody, nobody in life can tell me every decision they made resulted in a W. Schroeder bet on himself. And the slander towards Schroeder is like, okay, was he kind of ridiculous for saying he turned down the four years 84 and he, he felt like he was worth 120? Yes, that was a little ridiculous. But at the same time, you got to see what he's coming from. Like, he values himself that way. Can you be upset? At the way he values himself. That's just my opinion. So, yes, he signed a one-year, what, $5.3 million deal with Boston, a lot less than the four years, 84, he could have took with the Lakers. But it could be a blessing in disguise because if Schroeder goes out there, play his role, and so Dennis Schroeder is no scrub, by the way. Mm -hmm. Everybody gets lost in where he valued himself and, and makes it like Schroeder is some scrub asking for $27, 28000000 million a year. Schroeder is no scrub, like, in the regular season, this past season, he was really good. He had the flop in one, you know, in against Phoenix in the playoffs, and now all of a sudden he's a bum. Send him to, you know, play for the Shanghai Sharks along with Kuzma. But people forget <laughs> Schroeder is really a baller. I think his role is a six man, and I think there's some very valuable six men, six men in NBA history. I mean, you talk about if your role is a six man and you're really good at it, you'd be in the elite company of like Mano Ginobili. Jamal Crawford, those are six men. Look how look how well Jordan Clarkson exceeded as a six man over there in Utah. Like he was the difference in wins and losses in certain games. So I think that is Schroeder's kind of role, or he could be the starting point guard on a bad team, kind of like when he was at OKC. But I think other than that, like when they ultimately had that ultimate success, he was the six man, and I think that's where he fits. So how do you feel about Schroeder betting on himself and kind of the slander and backlash that we're seeing here? You know, we see the same thing on NBA Twitter that, that Schroeder is getting. Yeah, man, I agree with everything you said. And, like, sure, I've been guilty of liking a couple of tweets that, that make fun of it. Because, like, it is a little bit funny. Like, it, it's just that he, he did have a great offer and he did pass on it. So I'm like, haha, whatever. But still, the dude's making more money than I'll make in my entire life. <clears throat> so that is a start. He's making more than I'll ever make. He's only going to be 28 next offseason, so he's going to have another shot to get a long-term deal like 
people bet on themselves. And what did what did the Lakers expect him to say? Like, oh, I'll take eight million a year to be a sixth man, or I'll take twelve million a year to be a backup point guard, or he wants to start first and foremost. And I don't know if that's his future or not. I agree with you. I think he's more of a sixth man on a good team or a starter starting caliber point guard on a not so good team. He can give a team 16 to 18 points. He can give a team five assists a night. Like he is a decent player. He can play defense. Like he's a good player. I think that he can play winning basketball. Um, He is a quality NBA option. Now is that worth 21 million a year? I don't think so. Is it worth like 15 million a year? I think he could get like a four for 60 and that wouldn't be the end of the world. Um, You look at Conley, he got three for 72 or whatever it was. So he's getting 24 million a year. Um, I think Schroeder is a tier below that as a point guard, I think maybe even two, but still the dude can get a three for 45 or three for 50 or something substantial. Like, is he going to get 21 million a year unless he's an all-star this season? I don't think so. Um, But he's still somewhat young. He's going to a team that lost their point guard. He's going to a team that is going to be good this season. So if he wins, he's going to get that um, going for him. So he's going to have opportunities to play winning basketball. I think he's going to play winning basketball. And it sucks that he missed out on that money. Um, But still... $5 $5 million is is not too bad. I guess it's easy for me to say, um, but I think he's going to be all right. Yeah, I definitely agree. I mean, you know, him making $5 million in a year, I could only fa- – give me $5 million right now. Like, yeah, you know, for the rest of my life. <laughs> yeah, it'll, it'll change my life. So, you know, it's still – betting on himself and coming out, getting $5 million is not a bad deal, especially with being eligible for a long-term contract after this season. It's, you know, it's there's something to prove here, and a lot of people – have done it. I'm a fan of a team who watched a guy do it and ultimately broke his ankle while doing it. And, you know, talking football with Dak Prescott, betting on himself and not signing the initial long-term deal, broke his ankle and still got what he wanted, essentially, you know, out of the Dallas Cowboys. So I understand, you know, like that comparison is like, well, Dak is obviously more valuable and worth more than Dennis Schroeder, of course, but it's the betting on himself aspect. And if he proves his worth, even if he's like, okay, maybe I need to, lower where I feel like I'm worth a little bit, he still could come out and get what he feels like he's worth. And I understand, you know, and, and we, we crack jokes and I make some look bad and whatever, you know, but at the end of the day, like this dude is still a pro. He's still going to contribute on a contender. He's still playing for the Boston Celtics. Who's going to be a good team. That's going to go to the playoffs. And he's, he's probably going to live a lot better life than, than most of us that, uh, ultimately is on NBA Twitter. So therefore, (laughs) you know, it's kind of flat out hating (laughs) uh, if you just really go in too much. So I want to close out last topic, but this is a good one. This is, it'll be a little lengthy because we, we, the NBA draft just happened. Obviously we see some teams and we're like, man, those were steals of the draft. Those were great additions to these teams, but we've been able to see these rookies on display already right after the NBA draft on display here on the NBA Summer League. So I want to get, you know, your thoughts on who did you absolutely, like, who are you impressed with so far? And I know we don't want to go too crazy on the Summer League, but the fact that we've seen, these are a lot of hungry guys on the court essentially playing against each other. And you see a little bit, you see some flashes of some guys, you see, hey, he was a steal, look at him, he's playing really good. Obviously, they're not playing against the best of the best, they're playing against some guys who are going to be on the G League, some guys end up overseas, and some guys are fighting to make a roster. I understand that, but just being able to see these guys on the court and show us a little bit of what they do, I call it pro-am style basketball, but being able to show us and just compete, who have you been impressed with so far throughout the summer league? Yeah, man, I I got like nine takeaways. Like I, I was putting together my notes, and I just love the summer league, I think, you have to take the results with a grain of salt. Like you said, like it's not going to indicate a lot, but there are certain things that translate like Davion Mitchell's defense. That's going to translate to NBA players. Like he was shutting book Knight down when they played. Um, I think Jalen green, his bag as a scorer is going to translate. He's going to be like a top 10 scorer in the league one day. Um, I think that might even be not giving him enough credit. Like he's so advanced at his age. 
Um, I like him a lot. I think Alperin Sangoon, like the Rockets had a really good draft. Sangoon, Josh Christopher, Garuba, um, Jalen Green, dude's footwork, it's like exquisite. And I know that not a lot of, there aren't a ton of back to the basket bigs right now, um, which is kind of why I like him. He's interesting. I think he's improved as a rebounder and defender. I think Kevin O'Connor was tweeting out some clips on that. Um, Emmanuel quickly looks improved, uh, more comfortable, more efficient. Desmond Bain looks improved. His playmaking is taking a step up. He was already lights out. Um, Cam Thomas is a bucket. Like that's not surprising anybody. Jalen Suggs is going to make an instant impact on both ends. Like he looks not head and shoulders above everyone else, but he looks like an NBA player. Like he looks like a guy who didn't need a college season in order to play. Um, Sharif Cooper I wasn't a big Sharif Cooper guy. Like I, I knew that he was such a good passer. Like he's insanely gifted, but I was worried about the size and I was worried about the jump shot. Then he goes out and is like completely lights out in his summer league games. Um, I think the shot remains key, but I'm really excited to see how he develops. And then man, last but not least, I'm excited for the warriors this season. Like I like Jonathan Kaminga a lot. He's still very raw. I like Moses Moody as like a 3 and D guy, but to have both of those guys coming off the bench this season, they're yeah. loaded. And like once Clay gets back, they're going to be a – I don't know what seed they'll end up with. Like they could be – they were, what, 37 and 26 with Steph last year. So they're going to be probably a top five-ish seed depending on when Clay gets back. Um, if they luck into a 4-5 with like Denver, who's waiting on Jamal Murray to come back, or – a Utah or something like that. Um, the Warriors are going to be interesting. So I hate to ramble, but man, that was, I had so many thoughts on it. It's been fun. Yeah. And we, and we go start picking apart some of those thoughts. Cause we, we got you pretty much the same idea. We're watching the same game and pretty much coming away with the same thing. I've been, I, I want to hit on the Rockets first off. Yeah, yeah. I'm most impressed with the Rockets. And obviously, you know, I watched, the game of all games for the NBA Summer League, the number one pick versus the number two pick. You know, it was must-see TV. ESPN knew it, and they put we're, – we're now seeing Summer League games be on ESPN. We're seeing draft prospects really become big time. We're seeing the NBA draft become huge now. Usually it's like, ah, you know, guys, we watch Summer League, but if you have NBA TV, have at it. If you don't, whatever. Now there's, like, key matchups that these mainstream networks are buying into. ESPN is buying into the fact – that, man, Detroit, Houston, Jalen Green, Cade Cunningham, that's that's must-see TV. Had they have matched up, you know, Jalen Green went to college in Oklahoma State and, and you know, let's say Jalen Green had went to Syracuse, Oklahoma State versus Syracuse, that's must-see TV. We got to see two of the best prospects in the NBA draft play against each other. So the marketability of the summer league is becoming a lot better, but what Houston has done, like you said, I mean, they looked really good against Detroit, first off. You know, Josh Christopher, Jalen Green, Sangoon, and everything. What I said after watching that game was, Houston's future is bright. Like, all three of those guys, I mean, Jalen Green looks like, and, and is expected to be a superstar in this league in the future. So, and now I look at Josh Christopher, and I'm like, he has an adequate game to, to have a really successful career. And now I look at Sangoon, and like, I thought he was going to go to the Spurs. To me, he was such a Spurs yeah. player. Overseas, stretch big, you know, like it was just something like he's such a Spurs player. And he looks like they have a, a rookie big three that I could see being a very effective big three five to six years from now. And they have a possibility of all three of those guys could stick together. So I like what Houston has done. Uh, I got to give flowers to a guy that I was high on coming into the draft. I wasn't first round draft pick or nothing, but I felt like he should have been drafted. And he's kind of proven me right so far in the summer league. Plays for the Indiana Pacers. Comes from the Ohio State University. My guy, Dwayne Washington Jr. I got to give him his credit. He did me proud. Game one of the summer league, he dropped, I think, like 23. And I was like, you know, everybody's talking about Jalen Suggs. And I think he had about 26, 27. And I'm like, hold on. Like, Dwayne Washington in the same day. At 23, let's give him his love. I understand he wasn't that prospect that everybody fell in love with. He wasn't the star, but Dwayne Washington Jr., I said he, he's he's key. What he could do well translates to the NBA. He can get a bucket. That That's what he did well at Ohio State. He's not the greatest point guard, 
per se, but he's a combo guard. He, he, he can score. He's a CJ McCollum more than he is a Chris Paul. So I think he could find a way, you know, with that. Like we like I love Cam Thomas going to Brooklyn is an absolute steal. The yeah. fact that Kyrie Irving is gonna come off the court and be replaced with Cam Thomas to get me a bucket is absolutely insane that Brooklyn was able to pull that off. So shout out to Brooklyn. Of course, he's getting buckets. So that that's it's the summer league is it sounds like we're getting a little excited about the summer league, but it's just as soon as basketball ends, the summer league is the next thing. Of, and we just finally get to see these guys put on a professional uniform and just play against each other. We get to see them live against other NBA talent at the end of the day. Like these guys are adequate NBA talent, not the college guys where most of those guys are going to go overseas and not play at all. But I, oh man, I've just fell in love. Like this summer league had me a little more excited than normal because you went through all those points and it's like, but look how deep that draft was. Like that that draft was stupid deep. And I felt like Golden State, like you said, I felt like they made the right move getting Kaminga and Moody because, you know, the speculation was they were going to go for a star. Possibly Bradley Bill. We didn't know if Dame was going to want out. And there were reports he would love to go to Golden State if he does ask for a trade. And, you know, he's like, I said, none of this. And we knew they had the assets that we like. They got two lottery picks in a deep draft. And then they have James Wiseman, the former number two pick from last year. And they have Andrew Wiggins, who's coming off of averaging 20 points per game and looked like a, you know, all defensive player And Andrew Wiggins. Yes, he's paid a little high, but you can, you can deal with that. He's still young. People still forget Andrew Wiggins is young, still ain't hit his prime yet. So he still has some, he still has some work to do and, and can be a contributor on a championship team. And I think that's exactly what he'll be this year is a contributor on a championship contender in Golden State, and I mean, we're talking about Kaminga and and Moses Moody coming on off the bench with Jordan Poole. So you know that's 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 kind of a dangerous team and a deep team, you know that that Golden State has going. But man, the summer league has just been second to none. Like it's it's been crazy. Yeah, man, it's been insane. And like you you touch on the rockets they have kevin porter junior too who's still very young hasn't been in the summer league like he was bonkers for several games last season so the rockets man they still have christian wood like this is a team that's going to be fun and i don't know what happens with john wall um where he ends up if he stays i think kevin porter junior is going to kind of force their hand a little bit but man they're fun and they're young they're fun. They have lob targets. They have floor spacers. They have guys who can get a bucket. Um, you mentioned Cam Thomas. He's that's insane. I mean, there's so many fits that are perfect. I think Book Knight is going to be a good fit with Lamelo Ball. Um, he's not going to have to create his own shot as much, which I like Book Knight quite a bit. But I didn't know if his self creation off the dribble was going to be great. Like his pull up threes, his stuff like that, where he has to get to the rim. Good athlete obviously um but his life is going to be made easier with Lamelo. you look at i mean desmond bain playing in memphis that's going to be an interesting fit um yeah. in year two jalen suggs fantastic he looks like a future star it, it's just ridiculous how much talent was in this draft and man going back to golden state not only are they setting themselves up to win now like because with the arms race that the nba is like unless you have Kyrie, KD, Harden, or LeBron, AD, Russ, they need a third, like wing star, like a small four, like a Paul George type star. I don't think Bradley Beal was going to do it. They wouldn't be able to defend enough. I don't think Dame was going to do it. They wouldn't be able to defend enough. They'd give up too much. Like they would have depleted their roster for a, another guard. Like I, I don't know if that would have been it. Um, Pascal Siakam. You don't want to give it all up for a guy who's not quite a superstar. He's just a really good player. So to keep Wiggins, to keep Wiseman, who I think is still going to be a good player, um, to keep Moses Moody, to keep Jonathan Kaminga, to bring in Andre Iguodala, to get Clay Thompson back, like that's a good team if I've ever seen one. Um, if Clay played the whole season, they could probably be a top four seed in the West. They might even be a top four seed, like the number four anyway. So I'm super excited for Golden State. Um, and I think the league's in good hands. Like the veterans are still here that, that we grew up watching, or I guess got older watching, I guess throughout high school and all that stuff. Um, but still 
lots of young talent coming down the pipeline. Yeah, and like you said, so there is one guy I want to hit on. You know, we both did a lot of rambling. I'm like, I, you would hit on something, and I'm like, all right, I got to make sure I address that. Jalen Suggs. So that's the interesting case, and here's why I think Toronto is going to regret passing on Jalen Suggs. First off, they let go of Kyle Lowry. Kyle Lowry dip went to Miami. So therefore, that could have been a young replacement to replace essentially Kyle Lowry and probably a better version, maybe not better in year one, but at the same time, like he probably ultimately will probably be a better player than Kyle Lowry. But here's my thing. A lot of people talked about Jalen Suggs and you said one key thing. He probably didn't need a year of college. He probably was ready to come fresh out of high school. And I agree with you. And it's not even about, we know he's talented, uh, but he has an intangible that people don't realize. He's a point guard. He was yep. also a top tier quarterback. In high school, which means he has the leadership factor. He has the everybody follows him. That his team it goes the way he goes. He's handled that kind of pressure. He was a, he was what a, I think a four star quarterback, a top tier quarterback. Me and him don't have personal beef because I don't know him, but I got beef with him because he was supposed to come to Ohio State and play quarterback. <laughs> so the fact that he chose basketball, good for him. But you, you should have came to a winning school, uh, and we wouldn't have no quarterback issue this year. But then. You look at that, and it's like, that means he has intangible. He plays first off the two positions that are leaders on their team. The point guard, the offense runs. The team runs how the point guard runs. A lot of times, especially when you have an adequate point guard in, in college, in high school. I know the NBA, the wings kind of run the league, but the point guard is the deepest position in the league right now. And so I just think that Toronto passed up on a guy who could really just handle being the face of the franchise and being, you know, eventually a number one or a strong number two, and at worst can really just be a true leader of your team for years to come. Not to rain on the Scotty Barnes lovers and not to rain on him. I think he's a really good player, but I think if we talk about maximum success in their career, I think at max, Scotty Barnes becomes, in a big three situation, he's the third. Where I think in a big three situation, like you're looking like, Maybe Jalen Suggs is the second best player, but he's the number one because he's the guy that's going to make all this fit and put together. So what do you say about the, the people just that absolutely – do you agree with Toronto going with Scotty Barnes over Jalen Suggs? Dude, literally everything you just said, like if you would have asked me first, I basically would have given the same thing. Like I think it's – he's fantastic. The leadership means a ton. He's NBA ready. I like Scotty Barnes a lot. I think that – he could be a Draymond Green type player, but then you think Draymond Green, third best player when they had KD and Steph, third best offensive player, I think. But yeah, yeah, even fourth, like his defensive value, people forget Clay Thompson was a really good defender. So like Draymond, prime Draymond for a few years, probably the second best player on the team above Clay. But overall, like now, if Golden State gets back this season, Draymond's the third best player on the team. He, he's not better than Klay Thompson. Like, I think Scotty Barnes on a modern NBA championship winning team, probably a third option, and there's nothing wrong with that. But when you're building a team, it's a lot more important to have the point guard, first and foremost, not a point forward, and then a guy that is super athletic like Jalen Suggs. He plays defense. He's smart. He can shoot the ball better than people think because of the percentages and all that stuff. I, I really believe in his shot. He hits big shots. He takes big shots. He's a big moment player. He's a team leader. Um, the coaches love him. Orlando has a ton of guards on their team, which is kind of yeah. why I was hoping that Suggs would end up somewhere else. But you have guys like Cole Anthony. You have guys like RJ Hampton. You have guys like Marco Fultz. None of them can lead nor set up a team like Jalen Suggs, so the rest is going to figure itself out. Like I was thinking um, I like Josh Giddy, and I was kind of hoping that he went there because then he could take some pressure off of the scoring guards and be that traditional passing guy. Um, mm -hmm. Also, I'm excited to see him once he comes back because he sprained his ankle. Um, he had that one dunk that went around, and I'm like, people act like Josh Giddy wasn't a good athlete. Like Josh Giddy, people who watched him knew that he had some some wiggle to his game. He was faster than people think. Um, so I'm super excited to see him. But back to Jalen Suggs, man. I think Toronto, you look at Cade Cunningham, Detroit's not going to regret passing on Jalen Suggs. Um, you look at Mobley, I 
don't think that there's going to be a, re- a regret there. Scotty Barnes, I think there's a regret there. Like if you look five, 10 years down the road at the end of their careers, or even in the middle of it, Jalen Suggs, like you said, a weak number one, like on a bad team or a strong number two on a good team. And he's a guy that you think of the um, Chris Paul, Devin Booker this year, like is Booker the best player? Yeah, probably. But who was the most important player? It was CP three. Like he was the stabilizer. He was the engineer. He was the, the straw that stirred the drink. And I think that Jalen Suggs, not to compare him to CP three in terms of how they play, but in terms of their um, value and how they stabilize the team, he's going to be something like that. Yeah, 100%. So you you came on, you put a great show, kind of made me look bad here and there uh, on, on some aspects. You know what you're talking about. So before we close out, <laughs> let everybody listen in on, here on Dash Radio on another Bennett channel where they can find you and your work and any future projects that you have that you're looking forward to. Yeah, absolutely, man. Uh, first and foremost, thanks for having me on, dude. It's it's always a blast. So um, I appreciate that. You guys can follow me on Twitter at Footnote. That's F O O T E N O T E D. I got uh, Chiefs and Royals stuff. So if you're somehow a Kansas City fan tuning in, um, tap in with that. I like to tweet NBA. I like to do NBA draft videos. Um, so I'm kind of in between NBA writing slash video gigs right now. Um, but follow me, and we can always talk hoops and stuff like that. I know me and Mo talk hoops a lot. Um, Mm -hmm. So it's it's always welcome. And again, thanks for having me on, man. Yeah, 100%, bro. I appreciate you giving me any amount of time. For those of y'all that don't know, this man is big time. Uh, He could downplay everything he does, but he runs the Rough in the Kicker podcast, which is pretty much the official podcast for the Kansas City Chiefs. He runs (laughs) the Kansas City Royals. So, you know, everything he does, he, he's official with, with these pro teams. So, you know, he's the number one guy. If Chiefs fan listening, you're a Mahomes fan, you want to hear some moves that the Chiefs have done, make sure you go check him out with the Rough and the Kicker podcast. He took it over from another great guy, Tucker, that we brought up earlier in the show. So, you know, uh, Kansas City and the Chiefs, they obviously know what they're doing, uh, given their mainstream content, passing it down the line. You know, it's, I can't wait till you get big to- even more big time and pass that on. And see who you know who ultimately succeeds you. But y'all know where to find me at Up and Flames Pod on Twitter and Instagram. Go to offtheballnetwork.com for all your sports needs and entertainment. And I appreciate everyone for tuning in here on Dash Radio on another but net channel on another edition of Up and Flames. And on that note, Up and Flames is out. <laughs>